Is it the birthday of Jesus Christ? Well, let, let's have a look at the Bible, see what the Bible says. Surely that can clarify this question. Well, no, it can't. You go home now and get the Bible down off. I've got many Bibles on the shelves behind me. You can't see them, but they're there <clears throat> in different languages because it's good to learn languages, the Bible. But um, the, uh, the Bible has absolutely nothing to say about the, the, the date of the birth of Christ. Nothing. Zero. You know, not, there's not, nothing about the, about, about the date of Christ in, in any of the Bible, in any, any, any of the, the uh, evangels. Okay. The Orthodox Church uh, in Russia, Serbia, Greece, and so on, they celebrate Christmas on the 7th of November, actually. And the early Christians, I thought that there's, just, there's nothing, no proof of the date of Christ, but the, the tradition was, the earliest tradition was, in fact, to celebrate uh, the, the date of Christ's birth on the 7th or 6th or 7th of January, which in Catholic countries, some of you may know, is still celebrated as Epiphany, uh, and by the way, here's an interesting point. Twelfth night, the 12 days of Christmas. Why are there 12 days of Christmas? It's between the 25th and, and the 7th. This 20, to the best of my mathematical knowledge, it will add up to 12, 12 days. You know, the, the famous carol, you know, because you know. Uh, yes, but still, why the 25th of December? What's that got to do with Christianity? The answer is, my friends, it has nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. Zero. Christmas, my friends, has got nothing to do with the Christian religion whatsoever. As a matter of fact, the Puritans under, under Oliver Cromwell, a subject I'm very interested in, as you know, actually prohibited the celebration of Christmas. They banned it. And the reason given usually is that there were a bunch of misery guts who didn't like to see people enjoying them. So that isn't the reason at all. The reason is that they knew their Bible and they knew their Christian religion and they knew perfectly well that Christmas was a pagan festival. That's what it is. What you're celebrating, is that, there we are, all the atheists present, which I hope is everybody, can now celebrate Christmas with a clear conscience. You're not celebrating Christianity at all. This is an ancient pagan festival. It goes back long before Christianity, thousands of years before Christianity. It's the celebration of the winter solstice. All right, the day, but give or take a couple of days. I'm not interested in that, but it's around the 25th of December. That was the celebration, and it was widely celebrated. The, rem, the, pag, the pagan elements of Christmas are, are clear for anyone with eyes to see. I mean, they, they look no further. Father Christmas. What was, what was this strange figure? dressed up in red that comes down the chimneys to give presents to kids and so on and so on. Well, who is this guy? Well, they've, they've slapped a Christian name on him, just to, as, as they would. Uh, Santa Claus, Saint Nicholas, actually. But that's just a, a convenience. No, no, this is a pagan figure. There's a pagan, a remnant of a pagan god. There's no two ways about it. Or other things like the mistletoe, they don't do that anymore, do they? They used to in, in our day. My day and Rob's day, you get a bunch of mistletoe, which is a, a plant which it's a parasite actually, it hangs from the oak tree. The oak tree was sacred to the Druids and sacred to the, the pagans. And on the uh, mistletoe, you find little, there's little uh, balls, shiny balls resembling the sun. And they thought that it, it, it came down in thunderstorms from heaven, from the gods. And therefore, they, 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 this was this was it was a fertility rite. So therefore, in my days, you you'd, you could kiss under the mistletoe if you caught a young lady under the mistletoe, unsuspecting, you'd give her a kiss. Of course, in in pre, 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 previous times, they did rather more than kiss under the mistletoe. They did a lot of other things, which is another reason the Puritans weren't happy with Christmas. <clears throat> then there was the. Uh, Something called the Yule log. You might know the word Yule is an old word, old Saxon word for Christmas. It's still used in, in Scandinavia. The, the Swedish for Christmas is Yule. God Yule is Happy Christmas and so on. The Yule log, it was a trunk of, of wood, which people, some people, but put on the fire before uh, on Christmas Eve. Now, um, actually, in the old days, it was a bonfire. In some countries, they still have these bonfires. And the reason was precisely because of the winter solstice, the shortest day of the year, the, the, the sun, you understand, was as important for <coughs> agriculture, was dying, was disappearing with the shortening of the days. And therefore, they believed that they had to, they were alarmed at this, and they lit these fires to attract the sun. And that was the meaning of the Yule log. It was then 
turned into something as innocuous as a chocolate Yule log, which may or may not still survive, I don't know. But all these trappings, the Christmas tree is the same, because these guys worshipped trees and uh, in, in groves as well. Nothing whatsoever to do with Christianity. And the legend surrounding Christ's birth is also nothing. It's nothing to do with Judaism, good heavens above. Look, there is absolutely no tradition in Jewish uh, mythology or religion of virgin births. That's entirely alien. The whole concept is entirely alien to Judaism of any form. The early Christians, after all, was a, were a Jewish sect. That's what they were. There's no tradition. There is, however, a very thriving, a, a famous, uh, well-known uh, tradition in, in Greek mythology and other ancient mythologies of virgin births. So gods in those days, they were more, more kind of cheerful chappies than what they are subsequently became. They come to earth periodically and impregnate the nearest available virgin. Either it, Zeus would come down in the form of a bull, very inconsiderate of him, or a swan, which was a little bit better, I suppose, or, or, or a shower of, uh, of gold. He impregnated Danai as a, a, with a shower of gold, which was much more profitable for the girl concerned. Yeah, but, but th th this exists in pagan mythology, but not anywhere in Jewish tradition. The Bethlehem itself, now that's interesting, but the star of Bethlehem, the three wise men, who are these geezers? Who are these three wise men? Again, nothing to do with Christian. They, they're known as the, the Magi, actually, you probably know. The, the three wise men, they're known as the Ma Magi, the Magi. The Magi were Persian priests of the Zoroastrian faith, nothing to do with it. It's an import from Zoroastrianism, this uh, business. And the star they were guided by, the star directed them to this place, with this little village, Beth Bethlehem, yes, it was an important little place, except for one thing. Bethlehem, Bethlehem in antiquity was the cult center of Aphrodite, or Astarte, or Venus, to give it its Latin word. The goddess of love, of fertility, and so it's all, all linked to paganism precisely, Not, nothing again to do with Christianity. Then they, the Bible tries to make uh, the most uh, convoluted story of how the Joseph had to go back to his state, to go back to, to Nazareth, because uh, back to Beth Bethlehem for census of the population. Now, here's an interesting thought. I want, you to, I want you to fix your mind on this thought, because it's an important element in what I'm, what I'm about to say. The period which we are dealing with, the first century AD, as it used to be called, anyway, right? We're not talking about the dark ages here, my friends. This is not the dark ages. This is the, 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 the peak period of the Roman Empire. And the, the Roman Empire was not illiterate, you know, on the contrary. There were plenty of writers at the time, plenty of historians, Roman historians, Greek historians. Oh, yes, and the Jewish, Jewish historians will come to that in a moment. You know, we'll come to that in, 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 in a minute. There was a, a wealth of, 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 of material. And here you have a situation where you have the Christian religion. By the way, I want to make one point clear. There is no argument at all that the Christian movement existed in the first century. I don't, don't quarrel with that. That's an established fact. <laughs> there you will find references, some references at least, in Tacitus, Pliny, and other one or two other Roman historians. Okay. But we're not talking about the, the Christian movement, we're talking about a person which is supposed to have existed called Jesus Christ, supposed to have been born on the 25th of December, the 7th of January, or whenever. And this was a remarkable thing. I mean, you, you, you read the Bible, you read the four evangels, and you see, uh, you see uh, mass movements. They were, this is interesting. Mass movements, huge crowds of people gathering uh, in different parts of the country, okay? And at that time, the blind saw, the deaf heard, the dead were raised, all kinds of miracles were established, you know. And one would have thought, would one not, that these remarkable events would have found some echo, they reflected somewhere in the written historical record. So the first place to look, of course, would be the, uh, the uh, Roman writers, uh, plenty of them, very, very good writers they were too. Uh, what is that? Well, there is no nothing about the actual person of Jesus Christ. There's nothing to report. 
It's true there's one or two sentences about the Christian movement in Tacitus and in Pliny, as I've said, but that, uh, that's not what we're talking about. About the person of, uh, of uh, a man called Christ, there's nothing, which is quite extraordinary. Even more extraordinary, there is one other source which I should mention. There was a Jewish historian at that time, therefore a contemporary source, at that very time. But the Latin, his Latin name is Flavius Josephus, okay? He was what, we, what is known as a Pharisee, an ultra-Orthodox Jew, and a Jewish nationalist originally, though he sold out to the, to, he sold out to the Romans, actually. He, he betrayed the, the cause and he went over. That's a separate matter. His, his writings are, are, are fascinating. Absolutely fine. Particularly the civil wars of the Jews is fascinating reading. And his own autobiography is there. It's a thick, a thick volume. I've got it on the shelf. It's a thick volume of his writings. Now, surely in the pages of Josephus, there'd be some reference to Jesus Christ. And indeed there is. There are two precisely. I've got them in front of me. But the main one, this one is very brief, it's not worth quoting. There's a longer one, which is a whole paragraph which I can quote from virtually from memory. I can hope to be corrected, but I think my memory is pretty good about on this score. What is your, what is Flavius Joseph has got to write? Well, he says at this, uh, this is in the chapter on Pontius Pilate. You remember Pontius Pilate was the man who uh, oversaw the crucifixion of, uh, of Jesus Christ. He did exist. Trace about that. It is known. We know all about, we know a lot about Pontius Pilate. We know that he was a governor of Judea at the time. We know that he was a particularly brutal governor who was hated by the, uh, the Jews. He was notorious for his cruelty and his, uh, his barbaric treatment of the population and so on. And yet, of course, when he, if you, it's a separate question. If you read the section on the crucifixion, he comes across as a rather a pleasant sort of chap, at least a weak individual. He washes his hands, you know. Uh, my hands, I, I am innocent of this man's blood, he says, and he blames it all on the Jews. This is the original origin of anti-Semitism which survived for centuries down to our own <clears throat> period. And the Jews, the Jewish people were, were, were blamed, accused of being the Christ killers by the Catholic Church in particular. The fact that all the early Christians, including Jesus Christ, were Jewish, that seems to have passed unnoticed. But Pontius Pilate comes off rather well, so much so that the Orthodox Church actually uh, 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 accepted pa Pontius's wife as a saint. She's a saint of the Orthodox Church, if you can believe that. Anyway, let's leave that to one side. This is Pontius Pilate. So in the chapter on Pontius Pilate, there is a paragraph, one paragraph, note, one single solitary paragraph, which says the following, I'm quoting from memory, but I think it's pretty accurate what I'm going to say. About this time, there was a man if it be lawful to call him a man, because he was a doer of wonderful works and he cured the blind and raised the dead and so on and so forth, right? He was the Christ. Okay. He was the Messiah, in other words. Uh, that, that's one paragraph. There's a few more words, but that's the essence of it, right? Now, one paragraph in a, in a big, thick volume, thousands of pages, there's one paragraph. Nothing before and nothing after that, for, for goodness sake. If, if uh, the author of these lines really believed that Jesus Christ was the Christ, was the uh, Messiah, then he would have a lot more to say on the subject, surely. But he doesn't. And it's not accident, not no accident that he has got nothing to say, because he never wrote the damn thing in the first place. This is a forgery. A blatant forgery, which is quite easy to understand. These uh, early manuscripts were copied by hand. Very arduous, difficult work, you know. It took <clears throat> decades to write a, a book like that. So imagine some Christian monk writing, perhaps centuries later, many years later, and he comes across, he's copying out, diligently copying out this work. And he says, well, 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 where's Jesus Christ in all this? He's not here. I better put something in. So he did. That's why this one paragraph, it sticks out like a sore thumb. Nothing before and nothing after. And it is impossible, my friends, utterly impossible, that, uh, that Flavius Josephus could have written those words. For one simple reason, Flavius Josephus, as I've already said, was an ultra-Orthodox Jew. He was a Pharisee. 
And for the Pharisees and the Orthodox Jews, the idea that Jesus Christ was, was the Messiah was absolute blasphemy. You go to hell for even hinting at such a thing. And therefore, you could clearly see that this is, a, a, although it's still being quoted as, as proof, it's not proof at all. Therefore, what I'm saying to you is out of, out of all the literature of the period, which is considerable, there is nothing whatsoever to prove the, that there was ever such a person existing as Jesus Christ. Nothing. Doesn't mean that he didn't exist, but there's no proof of it. In the pagan sources, there's no proof of it. So what are we left with? Well, we're left with uh, just one source, which is the, uh, the four Gospels. Now, question. <clears throat> Can you name me the, the, name the authors of the four Gospels? Anybody? Somebody remember from Sunday school? Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on, it's not difficult. No You'll never win a million pounds like this, you know. <laughs> or I'll put you out of your misery. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Yes? Yes. Thank you. All right. Second question. Who were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Answer. Come on, somebody. Who were Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Apostles. Somebody says it's a voice crying in the wilderness here, the apostles. Well, no, actually, they were not. Not in the slightest degree. Because the earliest one of these, I'm not sure whether it was John, actually. I can't remember which one it was. My memory fades. But um, the earliest one of these was written maybe 60 or 100 years after Christ uh, was supposed to have lived. No, 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 no. And, and the, the others were all later. The others you're talking about at least 100, 150, 200 years later, they wouldn't. Okay. So whoever these gentlemen were, they certainly weren't the apostles of Christ. They were people that took these names out of deference or whatever. And then, but then they wrote 100 years later or more than 100 years later, they wrote detailed accounts of long speeches Christ was supposed to make, like the Sermon on the Mount, which you all know by heart, I hope. No, if you don't, you should do. The Beatitudes, all, all written down. You know, after, this is a time when they didn't have tape recorders, you know, and uh, or, or shorthand, anything like that. And yet they, they, they perform. Now, there's nothing, nothing unusual about this. It's quite common. You find it in Caesar and other people. They put words into the mouths of people who are long dead. They put the words that suit them into their mouths. But here's an interesting point. The four Gospels are, are an interesting uh, source, but not in the sense you could imagine, not, not as gospel truth themes and express, not at all. First of all, they are full of historical inaccuracies, downright inventions, and they contradict each other frequently. They have flagrant contradictions. But even the contradictions are interesting. You know, it's, I'm not saying they contradict. For example, Come back to the Sermon on the Mount, which I'm sure you all know, don't you? Well, we'll see. We'll put you to the test. See how many of you are going to go to heaven at the end of this session. Uh, let's start in Matthew. Matthew you know. uh, let me see now. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit the kingdom of God. Yes. Am I right? Does that strike a bell with you? You remember that? Is it right or is it wrong? It's right. That's what Matthew writes. That's what he writes. And so on. Blessed are the meek, and so blessed are the meek, but the fallacial inherit the earth, and so on and so forth. All that. Very nice. Yes, but if you if you care to look at the gospel according to Luke, he's got something different to say. Let me see. Let me see. I've got the quote here. Yeah, I won't quote from I could quote from them, but I've got the text in front of me. There we are. Blessed be ye poor. Now then, is there a difference between that and what Matthew says? Blessed be the poor in spirit. A millionaire can be poor in spirit. Donald Trump can be poor in spirit and he can be a, a billionaire. Okay. But this is different. Be blessed be ye poor. For yours is the kingdom of God. This is Luke. Blessed are the poor for you. Yours is the kingdom of God. That's entirely different. Then he goes on to say, I don't have the glasses on, otherwise I can't read the damn thing. Just a bit. Sorry about this. Technical hitch. Yes. Blessed be ye poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are ye that hunger now, 
Matthew says, blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness. Again, a, a Donald Trump can hunger and thirst after righteousness or hunger and thirst after an election result, whatever you care to, to mention. Yeah, but this is, this is different. He says, blessed are ye that hunger now. I mean, that's physical hunger we're talking about. Blessed are ye that hunger now, for ye shall be filled. That's clear, isn't it? You'll have your belly filled. Blessed are ye that weep now, for ye shall laugh. And then he goes on. But woe unto you who are rich, for you, are, you have received your consolation. Woe unto you that, that are, are full, for you shall hunger. Woe unt, unto you that laugh, for ye shall mourn and weep. That's very, that's explosive stuff, isn't it? That's Luke. Okay. Not a word of that in Matthew about woe unto you who are rich. Not a word of it. It's been suppressed. Now, where is all this leading us? I could quote a lot, a lot, but there's a book I can recommend. Very good book. I've got it here. I've had this for many years. It's by Karl Kautsky. Yes, I know that Lenin called him a renegade, but that was many years later. In, 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 at the time I'm talking about, Lenin was a great admirer of Kautsky, who was a prominent Marxist theorist, and he was on the left, in fact, of the of the international social democracy. Karl Kautsky wrote a book called Foundations of Christianity. I recommend that you get hold of it. And it makes it all perfectly clear. And you see, we can't really base ourselves on any of this that I've mentioned. But can we get a picture of what the Christian movement was all about? Yes, yes, of course we can. To do that, we have to use the same method that Kautsky used. We have to use the method of Marxism, of historical materialism. And where you must start is to, is to understand the type of society that we're talking about. What was Judea like at the, at the time? What was it? Well, for a start, Judea at the time we're talking about was a Roman colony, a colony, a colony of the Romans. <clears throat> now, many people think they know about the Roman Empire. British historians traditionally presented it in a, quite a good light, you know, bringers of civilization. And so That's because they wanted to defend the British Empire with all its monstrosities. But those monstrosities pale into insignificance when compared to the monstrous oppression of the Romans. Oh, they were very oppressive. And that was particularly true of, of the province of Judea. Now, Judea at this time was, uh, by the way, at one time, it had been quite a prosperous area because it was at the, it lay at the crossroads of a, an important trade route. But that changed with the, with the development of sea trade, the advent of the Greeks, and so on and so forth. And therefore, the period we're talking about, Judea was a poor, impoverished, very impoverished province on the li outer limits of the Roman Empire. And to make matters worse, this population where uh, Jesus Christ said that, I said somewhere that the Jews are very, are very stiff-necked people, and so they are. They would not accept easily the dictates, the, particularly the religious dictates of, of the Romans. And therefore, that, that province was constantly in a state of revolt, which is why they had to impose a, a ruthless gangster like Pontius Pilate as, as governor. But of course, within Judean society, there were classes. There's always classes in any society. And then a class is here, which you can clearly detect. Now, one thing you notice if you read the Bible, I've read it many times, and it's, it's well worth reading. It's a very interesting book. But you notice that the society, that the circles that Jesus was moving in were always poor people. I mean, very poor people. You know, the poor, the unemployed, the dispossessed, the prostitutes, the lame, the beggars, and so on. That's the, the Bible's full of that. Okay, that was the circles that he was moving in. Yeah, but it, it, that wasn't the only part of it. They were the lower, the lower orders were, were terribly impoverished, oppressed, suffering masses and so on and so forth. In a, in a constant state of revolt and rebellion. Okay, and there were parties. That, what you must understand about antiquity, you're not political parties like today, but there were religious sects, which if you like, fulfill the role of political parties. These religious sects ultimately reflect certain classes or castes or groups in society. On the extreme left, to put it that way, there was uh, the, 
revolutionary movement called the zealots. The word zealot still exists in the English language, a certain connotations. One of the interesting, one of Christ's apostles, James, I think, was known as, you read the, the, read the it's in the book, James, the, uh, James, who was called, the, was zeal, uh, James the zealot, he was called. He was a zealot. So there was a militant zealot already in the ranks of the, uh, of Christ's d d disciples. And that's not an accident. But there was another party, an opposition party, if you like, I suppose you could say maybe the Blairites. No, that's not doing them a, a, a favor, calling them that. The Pharisees, I've mentioned them earlier. Flavius Josephus was a Pharisee. Th this is like a kind of bourgeois nationalist uh, movement who were opposed to the Romans. They hated the Romans. They hated foreigners. They hated the religion of the foreigners. Yeah, but most of the most of the time, their opposition was one of a religious character, just sticking to the orthodox, to the, the, the rituals of the Jewish church and so on and so forth, Jewish religion. Christ spoke about the Pharisees with withering contempt, you know, as we would speak about the Blairites. He referred to them as those whited sepulchres. A sepulchre is a tomb, white on the outside and inside rotten, dirty, dirty, filthy, dark, corrupt, you know, that's what he was, you whited sepulchres and so on, that's what he called them. That was the Pharisees. And then on the extreme right, you had the class collaborationists, the Sadducees, that's, that's the priest caste. The priest caste who look at, looked after the, the temple of Jerusalem and they collaborated quite happily with the Romans. They sold out entirely. And they adopted Greek names and they adopted Greek dress and they were thoroughgoing scoundrels. Now, one thing, when you refer to the temple of Jerusalem, I, I bet you all think of a, of a church, don't you? A temple, a church, or a Greek temple. No, 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 no. The temple of Jerusalem was not like that at all. The temple of Jerusalem was a vast uh, array of buildings and temples and houses and centers for trade and money, money uh, changing and so on. That was the one prosperous, the one wealthy part of the whole province of Judea. And the reason it was wealthy is very simple because there was a sizable Jewish diaspora. Oh yes, it, 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 it came before the, 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 the Roman destruction of the temple. It, it dates a long way before that. The Jews were involved in trade. In Antioch and Alexandria and Rome and Athens, all these places, they were Jewish, sizable communities of, of wealthy Jewish merchants who remained loyal and faithful to their religion and sent back large amounts of money to the temple. We still get that today, actually, with the uh, Armenian diaspora, sending money back to Armenia, to the church and so on. So that the, the, amidst all this poverty, you have this, 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 uh, this appalling luxury, this, this morass of this, this upper-class gang, who were hated, of course. And the zealots were constantly staging riots and uprisings and attacking the... Uh, Temple. You see, if you look at the, <clears throat> the later figures, the parts, parts of the Bible, the only part of the Bible actually that contains, that might contain some germ of historical truth in it is the crucifixion, and that's relative. But a part of it is, it, is, it seems to be, some part of it, it, it is correct. Christ comes in from the desert. That's an interesting part. He comes in from the desert with his uh, supporters. And what's the first thing he does? You don't know. He goes straight to the temple and, and attacks the money, money lenders, over, overturns their tables. You know, you've polluted my father's house, he said, you know. Drives them out. Yes, but you see, <laughs> it wasn't a question of overturning a couple of tables and a shouting match. In order to do that, you'd require an armed insurrection. And there were many such insurrections like that. Of course. All of them are put down in blood, of course. Now, there is one other sect which I haven't mentioned for the lack of time. I'm going to, it's interesting, but there's another sect. And that was a communist sect. A very mysterious sect about which not much was known, mostly from Roman writers who wrote about them. They, they, they even wrote about them with some respect, as a matter of fact. They were known as the Essenes, the Essenes sect. 
And it is known that they were communists. They shared out their, uh, their goods in, in common, as did the early Christians. Now, if you read the Acts of the Apostles, which I recommend you to do, read the Acts of the Apostles, which deals with the early Christians after Christ was supposed to be crucified. The, the Christian movement did exist. And in order to join the Christian church, you had to part with all your worldly goods. No arguments. I mean, communists shouldn't complain when we ask for an increase in subs, you know, really. <laughs> the early Christians demanded that anyone that joined their, their movement had to give up all their worldly goods. I mean, everything, their house, their property, everything, hand it over. And that was then used for, for communal purposes, that everyone that was given a, a meal, they would gather together once or twice a day for what was known as the, Asini, the Messianistic Banquet. They'd gather together, they'd break bread, and they'd drink wine. And they would pray, I suppose, for the new Jerusalem. Yes, but it wasn't the new Jerusalem in the clouds they were talking about. It was the new Jerusalem on this earth. And that could only come about through an insurrection, a revolutionary movement, and the overthrow of the uh, Sadducees and the, the seizure of the temple. And this was the... They, uh, now, very little known is about the, the Sinis, but this is, this is clear. It was a revolutionary movement, and it was a communist movement. Incidentally, you know, they try to maintain that Christianity is pacifist and all the rest. Well, again, there's no tradition of pacifism in, Ju in Judaism. It doesn't exist. There's no such tradition. And the, the, these movements were not pacifists at all. They were very violent. They were a threat to the Roman establishment. They were a threat to the empire, and they had to be put down. And finally, when they really got out of hand, they really started to stir up trouble, they were put down. I think the emperor was Vespasian, wasn't it? But he was his son, a real gangster by the name of Titus, came with his regions to crush the revolt. That's when the, uh, Flavius uh, Josephus swapped sides out. And you realize he didn't stand his snowball stance. He changed sides. <clears throat> but Titus succeeded. He crushed it. It, it, it was a, a brutal... A, bloody thing, put down the insurrection, the Jewish uh, insurrection in blood, <clears throat> and the temple was destroyed. There's a, there's a, a, a triumphal a pillar in Rome, actually, which you can see still, it's there. Uh, triumphal Ro Roman soldiers carrying the loot from the temple, including the famous candles, the candelabra of the Jews, and so on. all this was taken back. And Judea was completely crushed. Now, the crushing of the Jewish revolt which coincides with the period where, where Christ was supposed to have lived. It's not clear that he did exist, but there we are. The crushing of the, that, of course, was a turning point. And I think there must have been a mood, a mood of complete despair at the time, complete despair. And arising out of this, there were certain tendencies that thought, well, perhaps we better rethink our tactics and perhaps we better turn inwards and maybe the kingdom of God is not on this earth, maybe it's in heaven and so on and so forth. Here is where you get the origin of the Christian movement. Okay, this is this is it. It, it almost almost one hundred percent certain it was an offshoot of the Essenes, a tendency of a, fa a faction of the, the of the Essenes. Now the incredible thing about the, about the Essenes is this: when Kowski wrote his brilliant book, which I think still stands the test of time, uh, he, he he made this point. Of course, he, he couldn't know. All he could base himself on was the very slim evidence from, from Roman sources about the Essenes. And nobody could have ever imagined that material, documentary evidence, physical evidence would ever be found of this sect, who lived in the deserts, by the way, outside of the capital. They, they lived like guerrillas, if you like. In the, the, yes, but in the late 1940s, by accident, a young Bedouin kid looking, looking after his goats in a, in a cave in a, in, a, in a very remote area of, of, of Galilee, actually, discovered near the Dead Sea a, a series of scrolls, scrolls rather. And when these were deciphered, the, the archaeologists were astonished because uh, these were Essenian scrolls, no, no two ways about it. Now, it took them many decades to decipher these scrolls. I remember at the time I was in school in the 1950s. And I remember they used to have the, what they call the God slot on the television on a Sunday. And they, they, every Sunday there'd be something about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And look, this is 
proof of Christ's existence because there was clear evidence of similarity between this material and the elements of, the, of Christianity. It was clear. And yet it was a Jewish sect. So they, they were very excited about this. Then all of a sudden, I noticed this. Silence fell. Silence. As of the grave, not a word was mentioned. I did notice, however, I took an interest at the time, and I, there was an archaeologist, an English archaeologist, one of the leading people, leading experts on the subject in the Dead Sea Scroll, called John Allegro. I read his material, and I also, he wrote a book, I think, in 1969, called The Sacred Mushroom and the Cross. What struck me, I didn't accept his hypothesis, that's another matter. What struck me about it is that John Allegro, the conclusion he drew from his study, a careful study of the Dead Sea Scrolls, was that Jesus Christ never existed. And he says so openly, and it doesn't even, he doesn't even make it, he assumes that that's obvious. He doesn't even have to prove it in the introduction to his book. Now, the, these sects, were this, these documents, these priceless manuscripts, disappeared from view for how long? Was it 60 years? I think it must have been 60 years. 60 or 70, I don't know, a long time. And you know where they were all this time? They didn't disappear. You know where they were? Hidden in the vaults of the Vatican. Oh, yes. Catholic Church got hold of these priceless manuscripts and concealed them from view. And that's not an accident because any serious study of this would you draw very uncomfortable conclusions about the non-existence of Jesus Christ, for example, because these, these uh, scrolls were carbon dated, and you know the date they came up with, 140 BC, 140 years before Christ was supposed to exist, existed. There was evidence of similar, very similar ideas to the early Christians, and therefore that completely bears out what Kowski said. I won't to, 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 to stress too much on this. I don't have a lot of time, and this you know, comments can look into this. This is a fascinating thing, but by all means, read, read Kautsky's book. I think he said what uh, all, all that is important to be. There's a lot, there's a lot of other stuff. I, I've read other material. There's plenty of books on myself and shelf behind me about the Dead Sea Scrolls. There's an enormous, because then what happened inevitably with the internet and so on, a group of, I think, American scientists. <laughs> got hold of the internet and they, they hacked their way into the Vatican uh, archives and they took the lot out and they published them on the web. Bang, big crisis, big crisis. And ever since then, a, a dispute has raged, F furious controversy. Or oh, you got opinions, opinions to suit all tastes. Of course, of course, because this evidence is still very fragmentary. And of course, you can read anything into it that you wish, more or less, more or less. But in my view, it is completely evident that what Kowski originally put for his thesis was correct. I don't have the slightest doubt about it. But as I say, there's this controversy which still continues. The Jews are up in arms about it. The Israelis were up in arms about it. Because they say, well, by what right does the Catholic Church uh, sequester important historical documents pertaining to the history of the Jews. It's, a, it's our material, and therefore it should be given to us, which they refuse, but now, now it's available. So you have this dispute. Now, what conclusions do we draw from this? Well, first of all, it is not really a, a fundamental matter for us as materialists, as Marxists, whether there was an historical person called Jesus Christ or not. I suppose there might have been, it's difficult to, to know the facts, it's difficult. but I think that Kautsky's explanation is the most uh, satisfactory. Per personally, it's more, li more than likely that the picture you have in the, in, the, uh, in the Gospels, which cannot be taken as uh, historical documents, is probably a composite picture of several persons which actually did exist. They, they did exist, they were known as false prophets. We know their names. There was a one, for example, by the name of Judas of Nazareth, Nazareth or Judas of Galilee, I beg your pardon. He was one of these uh, who led uprisings and so on. So uh, it's probably a composite picture, which has been doctored. The whole thing has been doctored. Probably the oldest book in the New Testament, you know what it is? It's the, uh, the Apocalypse. You know, that's, that's, that, makes, that makes good reading. You know, read something over Christmas. 
That's fiery stuff, and that's real revolutionary stuff. Engels says that that comes perhaps closest to, to the mentality of the early, early Christians, who were revolutionaries after all. Now, the first point I would like to make is this. The Communist Manifesto tells us that all previous history is the history of class struggle, and this is no exception. The early Christians were a manifestation of, of class struggle in a very sharp sense, very sharp sense, in, in, in Judea, against the Roman, Roman rule, Roman oppression, and also against the ruling class, the Jewish ruling class, and also against the Sadducees, the equivalent of the label right, right wing, if you like, these uh, reformist elements like uh, Flavius Josephus, the white sepulchres, as, as Christ was supposed to have called them. A sharp class struggle, and in the, actually, if you read the Bible, which I don't suppose you do, but I've read it very carefully over many years, there is men, this is dynamite. If you read where it says, I've got Kowski quotes, the passages that you'd be interested in, really sharp denunciations of the rich, you know, and uh, also, of course, they were communists, as, I, as I've said. So what occurred? Well, the Christian movement was a revolutionary movement, and it was a communist movement. There's no two ways about it. In its origins, yes. What occurred? Well, you know, the ruling class has got many different ways of dealing with uh, revolutionary movements. You know that? Uh, they've been around a long time, and they learned a few tricks. The first method is repression, and they tried that. And the Nero and, and uh, Domitian and, and uh, others, they tried repression. You know, throwing the Christians to the lines, just to subject them to, to barbaric tortures, it's hair raising, uh, reading. They tried all sorts to stamp out this this religious this threat. They saw it as a threat. Even by the way, when Jesus was executed, uh, what he had uh, over his cross was uh, Inri. You know, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. That's a political offense. It's not a religious, not a religious effect, offense. Here's a man, according to them, who set himself up as, as king, as leader of the Jewish people. That's a, a sedition. That's revolutionary stuff. But the Romans wanted to put this movement down. The early Christians also, they broke they, this inter, you can read this in the uh, Acts of the Apostles. They gradually moved away from being a purely Jewish movement, and they, tried, they reached out to the poor people, the oppressed people of other nations. Okay. Including, for example, women. Women played a very important role in the early Christian movement, isn't it? although it's not clear from the... Because Christianity, like all the main religions, is entirely misogynist. Entirely misogynist. And yet women did play an important role. They were like Mary, the figure of uh, Mary Magdalene has been put forward now by feminists and so on. It's an interesting point. And they appealed to the Romans. And they appealed to other people. For example, they abolished the the the, the, the practice of uh, what do they call it of uh, circumcision. That's right. You know you know what circumcision is. It's a pleasant little operation where yet your part of your penis is uh, is removed and so on and so forth. Uh, they they abolished that, but that was one big <laughs> big objection, which uh, a Roman uh, potential con convert would probably uh, have. But they made it they made it easier for foreigners to join. But they'd be mainly be poor foreigners, yes, mainly but not entirely. Because the Roman Empire at this stage was so rotten, so corrupt, so bankrupt. You know, when a, when when society enters into that state, you see that now under capitalism, you know. No, but it isn't just an economic question, you know. It isn't just a question of economics. People no longer believe in this system. They don't believe in it. They don't believe in its institutions. They don't believe in its police and its judiciary and its in its governments and its uh, political leaders, in its religion, in its morality. They don't believe a word of it. It's so, it stinks of hypocrisy. Therefore, the temples were empty. Nobody used to, nobody used to go to the temples anymore. Didn't believe in it. And you get that now, don't you? That's why you get a, an epidemic. There was at that time there was a plague. Roman writers complained about this. It was a plague of, of uh, mystical sects coming from the East. Uh, Christianity was only one of them. There were many others, like the cult of Mithras, and that, that nearly took over. The cult of Mithras was popular among the, the soldiers, the legionaries. But eventually the Christians got lucky. They, they became the, uh, the, the one that took over. 
and they could not be suppressed. They became a mass movement, and by the way, quite a successful movement. And as it grew also, it became more and more, shall we say, prosperous, bureaucratic, you know, a bit like the Labour Party, if you like, the Labour movement. With the result that by the third century, by the third century, you had, oh yes, the, the bishops. Who was the first bishop? Can somebody say, come on, quick, who's the first bishop? Everyone says Peter or Paul. Wrong. You know who the first bishop was? Judas, Judas Iscariot was the first bishop. The episcopos, the, the bishop, was the treasurer. And how many times in the history of the trade union movement is the treasurer run off with the funds? <laughs> Quite a few times. You know, it's, uh, particularly if you're, if you're underground, you know, the temptation is very strong. The bishop was the guy that had uh, uh, kept hold of the purse and distributed it, supposed it equally among, uh, uh, equally among everybody. Yeah, yeah, sure. The bishops, and of course, gradually the bishops rose above the rank and file, same as the trade union and labor bureaucracy. They've risen above the rank and file. Oh, yes. And... Uh, uh, Edward Gibbon here is a marvelous historian, one of the great historians, an Englishman by the name of Edward Gibbon in the 18th century. He wrote a great work, which you should all read if you can. The Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire, it's called. Gibbon was a, a, a man of the, uh, of the, uh, the, the period of, of reason. He was a rationalist. He was also an atheist who hated the Christian. <laughs> he hated the Christians. But he actually blames them to a large extent for the collapse of the Roman Empire, which is a bit unfair, actually. But no, he, he, in the footnotes, his footnotes are interesting, like Marx's footnotes, footnotes in Capital. I remember, I, re I read it, I read the, the decline and fall. Rob, Rob might remember this. When I was 14 years of age, I pinched Rob's little chair. I sat up in the garden one summer and I read all six volumes. I couldn't put it down. Fascinating reading. In one of the footnotes, I remember, he's referring to a bishop of Africa. Africa was a Roman province at the time. A bishop of Africa, and he, and he said, he said, this bishop, and he quotes his words, he said, my vows of obedience have placed me above the heads of 100,000 men and women, that would be. My vows of, of, uh, of poverty has given me an annual income of 100,000 golden marks or whatever it was. <laughs> and Gibbon typically makes a sarcastic comment. The worthy bishop does not explain to us to what, to what excesses his vows of chastity led him. That was uh, Gibbon. In other words, they, they became a privileged caste. And of course, the Roman Romans eventually, the Roman ruling class eventually realized that the, the, the repression was not succeeding, and therefore they've got another means, which is to buy them off. Buy them off. A Tory leader once said to the working class, he said, look, you, you, you guys, you people cannot win. You can never win. Because we'll buy your leaders. We, we always buy your leaders. He said this, a Tory leader said this. Well, it was the same 2,000 years ago. Yes, under the Emperor Constantine, he's, he's supposed to be a good guy, supposed to be a Christian. By the way, there's no evidence whatsoever that Constantine ever got baptized as a Christian. I think he died a pagan. There's only one source which says that he became a Christian, and that's Eusebius, who's a lying bastard. You know? But he, he, he says he, he made him a Christian on his deathbed. It's a lie, but so we wouldn't get his word for that. No, no, no. Constantine's mother was a Christian. That's another matter. But anyway, Constantine was a smart, he was a bastard, but he was a smart bastard. He realized that the repression was getting nowhere. And they said, well, let's talk to these people. Let's buy them off. Let's, which he did. He did. There is a famous, there's a passage, which I've forgotten where it comes from, but I've read the passage. Astonishing passage. Written by a bishop. It, it can be, he's ushered in, with all the bishops are ushered into this royal palace to meet the great man, the emperor, and so on. And he said, this place is so splendid, so wonderful. And the, the, the honest uh, men of religion were, of God were, were struck with such powerful feelings. One would have thought one was in the kingdom of God. He's in bloody Constantine's palace. 
you know, this, this is, a, we've arrived, boys, we've arrived. Yes, yeah, so of course, they had arrived. And Constantine, of course, he said, yeah, okay, we'll accept you, as, we'll accept Christianity. It'll become this, the state religion, okay, on one condition. I'm in charge. You do as I say, which they promptly did. There's only one snag. Now, listen, you see, at that time, the Bible didn't exist. There were no Bible. There were lots and lots. There were hundreds, maybe thousands of different verses of the Bible floating around in manuscript form. An intolerable state of affairs for Constantine. So he said, okay. You know what he did? He got, this is a fact. He got all the bishops together in one room. He said, now, decide what the Bible consists of. You decide. Well, they didn't decide. They took the time in arguing and discussing and debating. He said, okay, these guys are not deciding. Okay, fair, we'll sort that out. So what did he do? He surrounded the building with troops. He wouldn't allow any food in or out, no water, and nobody was to get in or out. And they made up their mind quick enough. Yeah. Persuaded by the Holy Spirit and by the lack of food, basically. And that's how the, 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 the Bible comes in, the, the Bible that we know comes into existence. It was only by, by luck that the, uh, that the uh, apocalypse was allowed in. It was only by luck, by, by, by these, which is just as well, because it's the most, most accurate book that, uh, that exists on the Bible. That's the story of early Christianity. And of course, thereafter, all references naturally to, they, you see, they couldn't actually remove all references to communism and equality and rebellion. They couldn't do that. But they did their damnedest. They removed a lot. We don't know what they, what they removed. We don't know what, the, we do know that for a long time, for centuries after this, there were wars, bloody wars against heretics like the Donatists in, South, in Africa and the Circumcellus in, in Africa who were, who were said to be communists. So this is it. So the, the, the empire took it, took it upon itself to crush all the revolutionary and communist elements in Christianity and therefore make Christianity, turn it from a, from, from a tool of revolution into a tool of reaction. The Vatican, the Pope and all the rest of the Vicar of Rome, that's all he was, the Vicar of Rome, nothing else, but he became the center of, uh, of international reaction, if you like, which it remains to this day. Now I'll finish because I've got slightly over time, but just to say, of course, we've got to be careful how we deal with the question of religion wasn't really the purpose of the tonight's discussion to discuss religion as such. Maybe on another occasion, if I'm invited back, we can discuss that. But I just give you one key. You must be careful because, you know, religion, it's not a, a logical, it's not a rational thing. People don't believe rationally. On the contrary, it's based on faith. And faith is not something you can easily disprove. That's why I wouldn't go out. I wouldn't dream of attempting to convince a Christian that Christ never existed in the same way that I put the arguments I put you tonight, because it doesn't cut any ice. Either you believe or you don't believe. One of the early church fathers, Tertullian, actually said, what did he say? Credo qui absurdum est. I believe it because it is absurd. Now, what's the answer to that? How do you answer that? There is no answer to that. It's a matter of faith, you see. Yes, but you see, there's always a certain element of class element in religion. Now, a few years ago, I presented Reason and Revolt, which, as you know, is a materialist and an atheist book in Mexico. And I gave a speech at the Polytechnic, which Jordi will know. There was a power cut. I think there might have been a strike on at the time or something else, but there's a power cut and the light went off. Perhaps God was annoyed with what I was saying. I don't know. But sitting, sitting in the back row, there was all the pet, there was a chock, it was full of students. And uh, sitting in the back, there were a bunch, a bunch of peasants, a group of peasants, poor peasants, with their sombreros and so forth, men and women, who were involved in, a, in, in occupation of land, revolutionary action, you know. But I, I probably made a mistake. I, I cracked a few jokes. I'm a, a bit of a, I've got a habit of cracking jokes. Perhaps I should be cured of that in my time of life, but there you are. I made a few jokes about religion. And when the question time came round, one of these women stood up, indignant at my remarks about religion. and said, I believe in one saviour, Jesus Christ, and so on and so forth. I said, oh dear, I made a mistake here. So I tried to rectify it afterwards. And the question is, I said, look, 
as far as I know, there are two Catholic, there are two churches. There are two, not one. There are two churches. There have always been two churches. There's a church of the poor people fighting for better conditions and a better life and so on. And there's a church of the landowners and the rich and the capitalists and, and, and the rest of it. I said, I know which church I support. So when he, on the way out, they came up to me and they were quite friendly and so on. They gave me some things, some gifts, little gifts which they produced. And I said to this woman, now listen, you say you believe in one savior. Yes, she said. I said, so do I. I believe in one savior. The name of the savior is the people because if the people don't take uh, power, then nobody else is going to help them ever. And they all, they all assented with it. They, shook, they agreed entirely. So that you appeal to people like that on a class basis. And, and that, then you, you can't go far wrong. You can even quote the Bible. They say the devil can quote scriptures. So I hope I quoted a few items and I might, quote, I might qualify for that role in the eyes of some people. Anyway, I regard myself not so much as a devil as an upholder of dialectical materialism and historical materialism. So I think we leave it there. <laughs>